our scripture reading and commentary, let's turn to Hosea chapter 4. We're going through this great book of the prophet Hosea, chapter by chapter. And certainly what we read here that was true in his day, we can see the same sort of compromise and uh, idolatry in religion in our day. And the Lord's not silent. As we've been seeing, that one thing about God is he will not have any rivals. And uh, therefore, we read here in verse 1 of chapter 4, Hear the word of the Lord. If there's ever a word we need to hear, it is a word of the Lord. But here, we're going to find in this chapter two different charges. One against Israel. And again, remember where you see Israel, or the children of Israel, at this point, it's speaking of those ten tribes of the north that had not yet been taken away into captivity. And then, as we read on the second part, we're going to see where the same word was addressed to the children of Judah, the two tribes of the south that did not go into Samaria along with the rest, but the Lord preserved them because out of Judah would come the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet they weren't preserved because they were any better. This is what we're seeing. This is God who saves and it's God who condemns. But here we see in verse 1 the Lord bringing this charge against the children of Israel. So that is against the land. This is as much like a lawsuit when he says here, For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. This is what men today ignore, is that they stand charged in the court of law. It's one thing to be charged in the court of men, but to stand charged against in God's court, facing his holiness and his justice, who could stand? And here, God is the plaintiff who brings the charges, and the Israelites then are called into question. And so here we have that controversy, both against Israel and Judah all together. And he says here, the charge, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. It's not that they didn't know about God. It's like many today read these scriptures, and so they form a, an idea of God, and yet to know him in truth, the only way to know him in truth is in Christ. And uh, so when it says there is no truth, there's no knowledge of Christ. Many are religious today. and Many profess to know God, but not in truth. Or mercy. Where mercy and truth have met together, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his death. And so therefore, no knowledge of God. Paul spoke of the Jews in Romans 10, where he said he noticed or declared that yes, there was a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The same thing would apply here. So by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. So here, when it says they break out, that there's no restraint. Men would be much worse were it not for the Lord restraining them. But you think about even in religion and their religious activities and ceremonies, the swearing, how many people call on the name of God, but lying. They don't know the true God and killing. In other words, they use their religion to denounce others, but they don't see themselves as guilty sinners stealing go through every one of these, robbing God of his glory. And 
So this is the complaint, that were it not God restraining sinners, even in their evil direction of their heart, were God not to restrain them, it would be much worse. And we don't always see that because of God restraining sinners and keeping them from being as evil as they could be outwardly. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And so in verse 3, Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of, the, of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. He is here pronouncing what will take place in very short time when he brings the Assyrian nation down to root them out from the land, not distinguishing between man or beast. Everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Total destruction is what is being described here. Let no man strive, nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. God had put those priests there as mediators in the land, and yet they were corrupt, and people became accustomed to striving with the, the priest, even as to the ordinances and the sacrifices that should be offered. And to them it was a burden. Yet God had placed those priests there for their blessing. But both priests and people were caught up in this corruption. And so when he says, let no man strive or reprove another, they had no regard for the priests or the priesthood or the sacrifices and how those were pictures and types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore had no regard for one another. They were striving with one another finding fault with each other when in reality none was better than the other. And so in verse 5 we read, Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. He's talking about destroying the mother. He's talking about Israel and how the Lord had raised them up and put them in that, that land yet all in one day would be destroyed. Any of the children that were produced as a result of being sons of Israel, none of that mattered, that the Lord would bring them all to naught. And so he says, my people are destroyed. It's talking about not here necessarily physical destruction, although that was coming. But notice here in verse 6, He's speaking there of being destroyed for lack of knowledge. They boasted in what knowledge they thought they had. That's the problem we have today. There's no one asking questions. Everybody's an expert. If you ever find somebody that's willing to sit down and open this word and read it and hear it and seek the Lord, there's some hope that that one's taught of the Lord, but I don't find that. You hear people making all these statements that they've heard and Every bit of it's a lie. And so sometimes you think, well, where do I step in? But as the Lord's taught me, if they're not asking questions, they're not seeking answers, especially the answer, which is Christ. And so this is the complaint. These are all part of the charges of God's controversy with these. It says, because thou hast rejected knowledge. It's not that it's not clear in the scriptures. In Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, but they have rejected when they read of Christ as he set forth in the scriptures, they turn thumbs down on it, just like they did when he came to this earth. They will not have this man to reign over them. They'll have a little Jesus that will be their buddy, like a little rabbit's foot they can call on every once in a while when they feel like they need it. But they won't have a sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just that they lack knowledge, but it's like Christ said, you will not come to me that you might have life. They've rejected him who is the wisdom and knowledge of God. So therefore he says, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, 
seeing thou hast forsaken, forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Here is speaking specifically to priests. And I know that there's some that reason that way. They say, well, if the preacher is misleading the people, then why does God blame the people? Well, the, the people love to have it so. Both the priest and the people are worthy of condemnation. So the Lord holds all the people. In other words, they will answer before a holy God. When Paul said he was free of the blood of all men, it was in this sense that every time he opened his mouth to preach, he was declaring Christ and him crucified. And therefore, would not be held accountable for not having preached Christ and crucified. I'm thankful that such is the determination the Lord has put in my heart that no matter what the text, we're going to hear of Christ and him crucified. No matter who the Lord brings in to sit down, I can't imagine having a needy sinner brought into our midst that I'm spending my time talking about morality or talking about gifts and giving and witnessing and all these things. We must hear of Christ. And so notice in verse 6 he says that thou shalt be no priest to me. One is not a true priest unto God who does not exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. What was the role of the priest to offer up sacrifices unto God as a covering at that time for the sin of the people? But here were these that were trifling with this, the very role of being a priest to represent the people to God. And uh, they were trifling with not only God, but the very souls of men. And so therefore he denounces and says, shall be no priest to me. There's been only one priest unto God that has been faithful, and that is Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in verse 7, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. The more they increased, the more they sinned against God. And that's why he says, therefore will I change their glory into shame. And he that seek to take the glory of themselves, God will bring shame and condemnation upon them. All the glory belongs unto the Lord alone. And here it says, verse 8, they eat up the sin of my people. In other words, in their preaching and in their ceremonies, they enjoyed the benefits of the people's sins, which means probably they were receiving bribes and they were partaking and eating of the sin offerings as if that was their just due. And so the priests were actually relishing in Israel's wickedness. And so it is today. You've got preachers that stand before the people and they lead them increasingly in their condemnation. The more the numbers grow, the more the sin abounds. Paul wrote about this of the Romans, that they heap wrath upon wrath against the day of wrath. The more you add, the more corrupt it is. Nothing that's being done is of any value before a holy God. So that's why the Lord promises judgment here in verses 9 and 10. There shall be like people, like priests. So there's nobody that can say, well, I don't know why we're playing when it's the preacher. You're supporting. They're actually encouraging one another in their condemnation. Like people, like priests. He says, I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. Notice that doings. That's all about works religion in it. That's what God hates is the works of men's hands and yet they continue to present themselves before God as if their their works can somehow bring satisfaction. They shall eat and not have enough. See that's what this waywardness does. There's never satisfaction. They shall commit whoredom. Again, whoredom here is in the sense of 
false worship and idolatry and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. And so it's like an insatiable appetite when it says here that they shall eat but not have enough. That's why you can never talk people out of their religious persuasion. They can't get enough of it. They enjoy, they willingly do what they do. And that's because their heart has never been taught of Christ. And you can see, again, the charge, boredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. It's talking about boredom here. It's talking about spiritual harlotry that's in the heart that has caused them to stray. Every sacrifice they made was to a false god. It's just like Paul writes about to the Corinthians there in 1 Corinthians 10, that they offer their sacrifices on the devils. It's devil's worship. If you want to get somebody upset today, just tell them that follow their works religion and pleasuring before God with pomp and circumstance and music and programs and all these things that people are caught up with that it's nothing but adultery and it's nothing but worshiping of devils. It says in verse 12 there, my people ask counsel at their stocks. So here it is again, looking to false gods. Speaking here of some of the pagan gods, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err, and they have gone whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains. These places that are ornate today and up on high hills, and built to be seen of men, it's not anything new. This is going on back in. Hosea's day, they burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. They like the, the peaceableness. It's like you build these huge ornate monuments to man's foolishness and people love it because when they walk in, they just, they express, oh, it just makes me feel closer to God. It's all fleshly. That's the way it was back here. Because the shadow thereof is good. They feel comfortable in the shadow of these groves. Protected from the heat of the day and somehow thinking that somehow they're, they're under the blessing of God. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. In other words, like parent, like child. I hear today and we see today how many parents are encouraged just to take their kill children to what they call church. Just make sure they're in church from a young age. Well, all you're doing is instructing those children the same idolatry and harlotry of false religion as, as what you're in. That's what's described here. Therefore, your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery for themselves are separated with whores and they sacrifice with harlots therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall so even here you can't blame the parents well if the parents just hadn't brought the children into those places of worship religion then the children would have been all right no here he says he's not going to punish them for anything the parents did or spouses because of their wives but because they themselves are separated with or they have the same sin nature and therefore shall fall. And so here now, having read these charges against Israel, the ten tribes of the north, in verse 15, now comes the warning to Judah. It says, Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, and that's Israel's, those ten tribes, following after the worship of the golden calf, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal. This was where these places of worship were, 
down in their part of the, the country of Israel. Neither go ye up to Beth Haven, nor swear the Lord liveth. At one time, Gilgal was a place where the prophets were trained under Elijah and Elisha. We saw that in 2 Kings chapter 2. But now in Hosea's day, these had become a center of false worship. Don't ever think that because now the gospel's being preached in a particular place that it's always going to be that way. The Lord warned those churches in the book of Revelation that were established through the, the truth and the gospel being preached, but the Lord said the day would come when he'd remove the candlestick, the light. And perhaps the place continues on, but it's, it's not a place of worship. We don't know what's going to take place even a generation from now as far as where the Lord has put us here in Shreveport to meet. As long as the Lord enables me by his grace, I'm going to declare Christ and his glory. But I can't say that that's the way it's going to be in a generation to follow. The Lord raises up a witness as he pleases, but he also removes that candlestick as he pleases. And here's a, an example with Gilgal being one of those places. And there's an interesting twist of words here when it says, neither go ye up to Beth Haven. You can look on the map and you won't find a place called Beth Haven. But it's referring to Bethel, that place where Jacob, the Lord encountered Jacob there and, and blessed and anointed that place. It, it means a house of God. That's what Bethel means. But here the, the prophet purposely by the Spirit referred to that place now as Beth Haven. And Beth Haven means house of deceit. So what was again a place where at one time the glory of the Lord was manifest unto Jacob and others at, at one time now has become a house of deceit. And if you go back and look in 1 Kings 12, that was the place that was the center of calf worship that was established in the south by Jeroboam. So in 1 Kings chapter 12. And so we see the summit then of the charge, both against Israel and against Judah. But here we see not only the sin, but the remedy. And thank God there is a remedy. Here he says in Verse 16, for Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. It can't pull its weight, a backsliding heifer. You hook it up and all it can do is regress. It's a weak heifer. That's how Israel is described here. But also it says, now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. So on the one hand, you've got these that are backslidden and continue to go backward, left to themselves, that would be all of us. And yet, we see here in verse 16, some hope that there is a remnant, that the Lord will feed as a lamb in a large place. Who's that talking about? But it's talking about those that are the Lord's sheep and fed by the shepherd, which is Christ. So no matter what the darkness of the condemnation. Yet there is that people that God has purposed from eternity to save and has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay their sin debt. Normally, when it says the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place, you think about a lamb in open country that has strayed from the shepherd and is vulnerable. And yet here, the point being made is that the Lord will be the protection. He's the shepherd, he calls his sheep and he delivers them. So whereas Ephraim, verse 17, Ephraim is another name that's given for the 10 tribes of Israel. Ephraim is joined to idols. You notice it says here, let him alone. I'll tell you, talk about words of condemnation. Some people say, well, I don't know why God makes a divide between who he saves and he does. I think he ought to just let them be. Well, 
If God ever leaves you alone, then there's no hope. You'll be joined to idols and you'll die joined to those idols. I thank God every day he didn't leave me alone. And that when it pleased God to reveal Christ to me, thereby I know Christ today and declare him. We don't want God to leave us alone. Not those that are the Lord's. Because we need him. We need him to be that shepherd. The alternative, verse 18, their drink is sour. That's talking about water that's not pure. Once you've tasted the pure water, you don't want to go back to anything that's nothing but sour. That's all false religion is. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love. Give ye. In other words, they desire to continue on left to themselves. And if so, they follow nothing but their own sinful hearts. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Thank God for the wind of the Spirit. Contrary to the, the winds of man's false worship, thereby taught of the Spirit, those that are his are drawn to Christ and Christ alone. Gracious Father, thank you for your word, how sobering, how solemn it is. I pray that you would not leave us alone and that you would take these hearts and seal them to your courts above, that we might never put any confidence in this flesh or follow along after the direction of this world, but wholly be shut up to Christ and him alone. And I'm thankful we have your word, thankful for the spirit that gives discernment without which we could not know Christ, but by whom we do know him and therefore are drawn to him. So I pray that you would continue to direct us during this time of worship to your honor and glory alone. And we'll give you the thanks and praise in our dear Savior's name. Amen.